Hello, and on behalf of the UK's four agri-tech centres, welcome. My name's Charlotte Smith. I'm a journalist and broadcaster specialising in rural affairs. But today, I hold the clipboard of self-importance. This may be a virtual event, but I am still in charge. Uh, today's event takes place at a critical time for food production and supply. Against the backdrop of COVID-19 and Brexit, there has been a renewed debate about the complexity and fragility of the UK's food system. I'm here at Rothamsted Research. Now, three of the four UK agritech centres have offices here, CHAP, CL and Agrimetrics. Along with AgriEpi, they aim to support collaboration and innovation right across the food supply chain. Now, the aim of this conference today is to bring together all those with a stake in food resilience to discuss the opportunities, the challenges and the priorities for action during this unprecedented time. The question at the heart of today's event is how can Agritech ensure we have ready access to nutritious food at a time when global challenges are placing increasing pressure on production and supply? We'll be hearing from a range of experts as well as from people from the Agritech centres themselves. Now, at 10 past four, there will be a Q&A, so please do get involved. Right, let's hear from our first speaker. Professor Tim Benton leads the Energy, Environment and Resources programme at Chatham House. He is a former champion of the UK's global food security programme and has worked with UK governments, the EU and the G20. Professor Benton. Hello, everybody. Today I'm going to be talking about uh, transitioning to a more resilient food system um, given all of the pressures on the future, and then think about the, the viewpoint of farmers within that and think about the role of technology within that. So I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about climate change, because of course it is a very big driver of our shared future. And as everybody will have noticed by now, barely a day passes before you see some new climate impact that is in the news. Uh, the four pictures on this slide are four pictures from the same day's news last uh, autumn, floods in Venice and in the UK, wildfires in Australia and uh, in uh, California at the same time. We know that climate change is having a whole lot of direct impacts mainly through driving extreme weather. And we know that climate change is also impacting on both farming operations through the, uh, the changing weather, but also the yields of the grains and uh, some of the livestock that we're growing. The map on the right hand side here shows uh, decline in, in wheat yields in the red across northern Europe. Um, climate change, of course, impacts upon weather. Climate change uh, is also about changing climate, which, if you like, is a kind of 30 year average weather that you would expect in one place. But climate change has impacts which are much greater than the incidence of storms or hurricanes or droughts or whatever, uh, particularly and increasingly we're seeing in terms of the way that climate is disrupting ecology, pests and diseases, whether of crops or livestock, or as COVID this year has shown of people, uh, emerging diseases, that is. Uh, we are seeing increasing biodiversity loss associated with a whole range of things, including climate change. And biodiversity, of course, has a big role to play in uh, preserving some of the things that help make farming more productive. And of course, climate change disrupts societies and the disruption of societies through people movement or conflict over resources in itself disrupts the markets into which agricultural produce uh, um, uh, deliver. Um, so. If you uh, think about the kind of the scope for climate to disrupt the market conditions, there's no better example than the food price spikes of uh, 27, 8, 20, 10, 11, where there were um, uh, climate impacts that drove uh, droughts that led to impacts on yields. That impact on yields coupled with biofuel policy coupled with a system that was increasingly under pressure from other directions, led to a shortfall in production relative to demand at that time or a perception of it. That led to markets panicking, governments panicking, putting in place uh, export bans. That led to an amplification of the price signal that drove the price up. That led to a whole range of negative uh, issues that spiraled out of control. Those negative issues in turn uh, led to food price riots in many parts of the world. 
those food price rights changed people's um, social economic circumstances at home, led to changes in uh, people movement across, North, uh, across the Mediterranean into Europe. And you can draw a line that they impacted on the market, they've impacted on borders, they've impacted on the growth of nationalism. And even you could argue that Brexit as a part consequence of a decade long travel from the food price spikes of 27, 8, 10, 11 is a consequence. So climate change is not just about when can we get on the field? Climate change is also about the whole market and the geopolitics of the way we run societies changing. So what do we do about climate change? Well, obviously, climate change is something that we can adapt to. We can reduce our risk exposure through thinking about farming operations, changing genetics of what we grow, getting more drought resistant varieties or whatever. We can think about more resilient ways of farming and uh, producing more food uh, in different circumstances using new technology, robotics and precision agriculture and so on. We can think about growing farm, farming in different ways using more resilient farming systems. And I'll talk a bit more about those later on. Uh, but there are actually, if you look ahead far enough, there are real limits to adaptation uh, in the sense of if we were to live in 50 years time in a world of three degrees, our farming systems would be very, very, very different and it would be difficult to imagine how we might adapt. And of course, as well as adaptation, we've got mitigation and mitigation is important both for farm operations in the sense of trying to reduce greenhouse emissions from farming operations using less fuel, changing livestock density or uh, thinking about how to reduce the emissions from cattle. But mitigation also has broader implications for the markets, both in terms of changing the demand side, and everybody will be aware of the kind of push towards changing diets for climate mitigation purposes, but also changing uh, the utility of land for carbon storage. And both farming for carbon and farming for different products because the market has changed are part of the how do we adapt to climate change. Now, climate change is not the only reason that farming is likely to have to change significantly over the next decades. Uh, the last 50 years of economic drivers around farming and investment in farming from governments and so on has been predicated on the assumption that the more we produce food, the cheaper it becomes and the better it is for economic growth and for people. And this is a graph on the left hand side is food price against cereal yield as an index of farming intensification. And on the right hand side is the kilocalories available per capita around the world on the right hand side against cereal yield. And what you can see is that those premises of designing the, our modern food system have come to pass. The faster we increase yield, the lower food prices become and the lower food prices become, faster we increase food, uh, food yield, the uh, more we have available per capita. However, we've now got to the point where actually we can see that as a paradigm of the past because cheaper food leads to negative outcomes as well as positive outcomes. And in this bottom graph on the left-hand panel, we have uh, food waste, as against cereal yield, so the same x-axis, horizontal axis as the previous graph, food waste against cereal yield. And as, as you can see, as we drive up cereal yields, the amount of food that we waste increases, but not only increases, it increases faster the faster we drive up cereal yields. There's an upward curve to that. And the panel on the right-hand side at the bottom is the prevalence of obesity in females on a global basis. And again, what you can see, the faster we drive up yields, the more calories become cheaper, more available, the more we consume calories and the more obesity uh, happens. So this is just one example of the negative outcomes of driving down cereal prices through increasing productivity. And actually there are very many more and I'll try and talk this through in this, in this slide here. The cheaper food paradigm, as I call it, is putting productivity growth and market liberalization at the heart of our agricultural paradigm. So what does that do? 
the more we produce, the more we produce cheaply, the more we drive uh, large scale production, the more we also drive climate change. Climate change in turn is driving the decline in yields on a global basis. Yield decline is therefore feeding back and saying, if, we're, our, if our yield is going down, we need to intensify even further. That's a bit of a vicious circle. As yields decline, we expand our agricultural basis on a global basis, and that drives yield biodiversity loss, which in turn drives yield decline. And then as we drive climate change, we need more land for carbon-based uh, carbon dioxide re removal, land-based carbon dioxide removal. Hence our discussions at the moment about planting trees all over the place. As we plant trees, land in different parts of the world, particularly not so much in the UK, is taken into agriculture to compensate. That in turn drives climate change. As we uh, intensify agriculture, we deplete the soils. As we deplete the soils, yields decline, and that feeds back on the need to intensify further. As we drive down the price of food through agricultural intensification and trade, that gives the rewards to uh, those areas that can produce at scale in the major breadbasket areas of the world. That leads to a concentration in crops. The top three crops in the world, as you all know, account for about 50% of the calories eaten, wheat, rice, and maize. That con crop concentration driving large-scale agriculture, monocultures, etc., drives biodiversity loss. As we drive down the price of food, it makes it economically rational to waste food. As we waste food, that drives climate change. You see where this is going. As we concentrate crops, cereal prices come down. It becomes rational to feed uh, crops to livestock in ways that were never available in the past. Uh, as we increase the availability of a few crops, that means everybody in the world is eating the same thing. Uh, we might have it in different forms, but basically all our diets are based on wheat, rice, maize, palm oil, uh, soya, sugar, etc. Um, all of that leads to malnutrition uh, in various forms from uh, uh, overconsumption of calories, uh, cancer related to eating too much processed meat, etc., etc. And as we dr uh, produce more livestock, that drives more climate change. And as the climate changes, it changes the way that plants grow and it reduces the nutrient content of, uh, in many grains and that contributes to mal malnourishment. So what you can see is the relationship between many of the things that society cares about, people's well-being, climate change, biodiversity, etc., is related to the way we farm and the way we farm is related to the macro drivers from uh, agricultural ministries around the world and trade ministries around the world. And it's absolutely the case that this is a kind of set of vicious circles that the faster we try and drive productivity, the faster actually these negative impacts spill over and make things worse in multiple dimensions. So we've reached the point, and there are so many reports that you've all heard of them, that there is a large scale need to change this system to make it better so it is much better for the planet, much better for people, and including farmer livelihoods, and uh, much better for nutrition. So the food system is going to change because of these drivers around unsustainability, poor diets, and so on, away from business as usual. Um, and as you can see on the left-hand panel, this is a version of the Fisher Circles diagram I've just shown you focus on productivity, more cheaper food, driving more waste, ill health, driving more climate change, blah, blah, blah. The bottom line of that is that the more we have large scale agriculture that specializes in fewer and fewer crops or breeds of livestock, the less resilient our agriculture also is. And we'll come back to that later. So if it will change, what will it change to? And um, this is a, a, a vision. It's not necessarily a vision that everybody would buy into, but many people do of what the future might hold. And that would be a greater focus, not on agricultural efficiency, but on the efficiency of our food system. How can we feed people whilst making minimal damage to the environment, feed people healthily by growing the right sorts of things for their diets, waste less and so on. To get to that, we need to recognize that food is not just a commodity crop. Food is associated with values for the environment, values associated with our health, and we would need to pay farmers to grow things differently in different ways. If we were going to focus on diversify, on healthy diets, there would be a much more greater diversity of uh, particularly crop plants, 
fruit and vegetables in our diets, we would need to have a more diversified agriculture. If we had a more diversified agriculture, there'd be more place for circular agriculture, including mixed farms. We would have landscapes which were less monocultural and more multifunctional. Uh, that might lead to more rural employment. If we had an efficient food system and wasted less and over ate less, uh, we would have less pressure on the land and that makes more space for climate-based mitigation, uh, which in turn reduces the drivers of climate. And above all, I think we would have more resilient landscapes. So that's a vision for the future. Now, part of that vision is about building resilience. And why do we need resilience? Well, obviously this year is a good case in point for um, why it's necessary to think about having systems that respond in different way to perturbations. But there are many drivers, not just COVID, of the way that systemic change um, might differ into, uh, might, might be driven into the future. We've got a large scale move away from international rules based cooperation, undermining of the architecture of the UN and WTO and so on. That means that nation states are no, no longer cooperating so much, they're competing. And that's making the whole reliance on globalized trade more dodgy than it used to be. We've got inequality as a large scale driver of social change, uh, which is meaning that unrest, nationalism, uh, libertarianism, etc., around the world is becoming much more a social driver and a geopolitical driver. We've got climate change and environmental degradation, which is uh, increasingly causing shocks to the system. Our global system is increasingly fragile because of just in time uh, supply chains and the shocks to the system are increasing over time. And increasingly, as we look ahead, we will see our system breaking a little bit. And we also need to think about adopting preventative healthcare because curative healthcare is becoming too expensive. So we might end up with significant drivers from the healthcare side to change what we grow and how we grow them. Uh, and the first four bullet points there are around the deglobalization agenda. Whatever our government at the moment says about uh, global Britain in a global world, there is a lot of headwinds towards increasing globalization and quite a lot of tailwinds for deglobalization. And just to emphasize that, that this is a slide that just has a, a number of the things that have happened in the last 15 or 20 years to shock the system, whether it is hurricanes or cold spells or whether it is changing social attitudes, new diseases, 9-11, um, uh, Trump's election, Brexit, whatever it is. Lots of things are happening. That means that the world is much more unpredictable than has been the case in the past. So if we're going to face increasing shocks into the future, what do we need to do? We need to have a resilient food system. And what is a resilient system? A resilient system which is, has the following four properties. It has redundancy built in. So it's not based on just efficiency, because efficiency means that you're taking out all redundancy. And if something goes wrong, the system stops. We need to have some redundancy built in. So if there is a shock, we've got stuff in the cupboard or stuff in the warehouse or stuff in the shed that we can continue to use. Uh, resilient systems are, tend to be modulized or distributed. They're not centralized uh, for the purposes of efficiency. They're not too specialized. They need to be diversified um, rather than focused entirely on just doing one thing in one way, because if something goes wrong or the market uh, uh, gets destroyed for that one thing, then everything falls apart. And we need to have more flexibility or substitutability built in. Uh, so that operations can shift or market res markets respond to rapidly changing conditions. And we've seen all of that this year. So what does this mean from a farming perspective? Well, when the world is stable, if you take a bet on doing the best possible, you're uh, effectively saying variation in my outputs are going to be relatively low. I know exactly what to do to maximize that, uh, those outputs. Then you automatically do better than somebody who says, well, I don't quite know what's going to happen this year, so I'm going to do lots of different things instead. I call that a normal condition specialist and a variability specialist. But as the variability in returns increases, the payoffs to those two strategies change, and there comes a natural switching point, the vertical dotted line in this graph, where instead of managing for the average doing better 
uh, year after year after year, actually managing to cope with variability does better. And this is the concept known as bet hedging. This figure here uh, is a, a result from a, an analysis we did a few years ago. The top graph is uh, average gross margins on a farm against the diversity of the landscape or the diversity of uh, farm rotations or farm outputs. And you can see there's a negative relationships. On average, a more diverse farm does less well over multiple years. But the bottom graph is how much fluctuation there is in farm income from year to year. And that is also a negative relationship. So there is a, a, a trade-off between the variability in your returns and the diversity of your portfolio giving rise to that. And that's a, a well-known result from multiple uh, areas of economics. In a good year, somebody who's specializing in the product that grows well in that year does well. But in a, if, the year, if a good year is one in three or one in two and it's unpredictable, actually hedging your bets and diversifying very rapidly becomes the thing that allows farm businesses to continue from year to year without catastrophic fluctuations in um, cash returns. So just a, a few minutes on the futures of food. I'm just going to talk through an exercise that we did with the World Economic Forum a few years ago, where we thought ahead and said, what are the drivers that are going to change our food system that we know are going to be important, but we can't predict? And in a big expert group, we came up with the first two drivers that we knew were going to be important, but we couldn't predict exactly what they were. Um, in terms of the vertical axis, uh, free trade becoming more free or moving away from globalization towards regionalization or localization. And then on the horizontal axis, uh, moving from unsustainable and unhealthy diets towards sustainable and healthy diets. These were the two big things that uh, the group thought were going to be uncertain about the future. And there are many drivers that you can think of for growing globalization or growing deglobalization. The red arrow downwards is where we've been for the last five or 10 years growth of protectionism, growth of nationalism, breakup of rules based international cooperation, growing war, ter terrorism, insurgency, climate migrants, et cetera, et cetera. The, red ver the green vertical line was where we were 10 years ago, where we thought the world was stable. We were looking towards much more big multinational uh, ownership of our trade relationships, stable governance, strong and stable, as we used to say, and strong international cooperation. With respect to shifts to diets, you can think of many drivers again, whether from an environment perspective, carbon tax, payment, uh, public money for public goods, et cetera. And from a health perspective, you can think of many reasons, uh, again, why politicians and societies will want to incentivize people eating well. The details of this really don't matter, but you can put, and the report that's freely available on the web puts words into each of these boxes to tell stories of what it would be like to be in a world where free trade increases or globalization decreases and we become more regional and people change diets or don't change diets. But I just want to focus a little bit on the two right hand quadrants where globalization continues to happen in a way that we thought it would 10 years ago versus where globalization gets uh, rebuffed and people move towards more local and regional markets. And at the same time, people are generally shifting towards more healthy and sustainable diets, which I think is the direction of travel we're on. And I just wanted to think about these two things from a point of view of technology and the research necessary for farming, the farming agenda under these two scenarios. So starting off, if we're in a world where there is more free trade, we are effectively growing the things that we're most uh, good at growing, we're specializing, we are throwing um, we are exporting our e excess and importing in, um, what would the world be like? Well, we would still, even though people are eating more sustainably and healthily, we would still grow large scale commodity crops because that's what we would be good, good at doing. But we would find clever technologically driven ways of making those diets more sustainable and healthy. We would use biotechnology and biofortification to engineer in the uh, nutrients, the vitamins and the minerals that people need. We would change the way that we formulated our processed foods and would still continue to eat lots of ultra processed foods, but we'd make them more healthy. And we would continue to have long supply chains. And that's a world, a vision for the future of a world of robotics and high tech and all the rest of that. 
But in contrast, imagine a, a world where people are switching to sustainable and healthy diets, and yet we want to move towards local or regional markets because either the risk of relying on trade becomes too big because it becomes too fragmented by what's going on in the world, or we want to have a greater degree of self-sufficiency to protect ourselves or because citizens want to eat more local foods. If we have a food system based on uh, more local uh, uh, supply, we would need more varied diets to provide our nutrients if we're trading less. We'd need to grow more varied things. We'd need more varied farming systems. Those farming systems would not necessarily be a large scale enterprise, but there'd be a small scale, more diverse, uh, much I mean, it could be a large scale enterprise, but more, more diverse rotations, more products coming out of it. Because we'd be growing things that we would at the moment import, more fruit and vegetables, for example, uh, we might have less agricultural efficiency in a world of comparative advantage. And we'd have to focus then on having a systemic efficiency, less waste. People would not be able to get the added value from ultra processed food and more, more likely to eat whole foods cooked at homes we would have to pay more for food. So farmers get rewarded for producing this diversity of food for nutrition and sustainability reasons. And of course, we'd have shorter supply chains and we wouldn't be having uh, food produced in one country with ingredients from 17 different countries uh, to go on at the shelves in every supermarket around the world. Very, very different views of the future of technology for farming. And the final point I want to make is that technology by itself is often a wonderful thing, but a technology alone doesn't solve the problems of the world in terms of building resilience, building sustainability, building healthy diets, building a secure livelihood for farmers into the future. Technology is one small part of a jigsaw of socio-technical change. So this diagram here shows a whole set, eight different, we call it the pizza diagram, eight different components of a technology that's being developed, how it gets up, um, upscaled so that everybody can use it. It's not just about it gets adopted. We often need an enabling social license, engagement with citizens. We need to transform mindsets throughout, need changing policies and regulations. We need new market incentives to scale up and so on and so on. So technology is going to be at the heart of the future but it might not be the technology that you immediately think of when you look ahead. It might be the technology of driving circular farming that is diversified on both the east and the west of the country, rather than large scale uh, commodity crop agriculture on the east side and large scale livestock agriculture on the west side. So finally, uh, a few conclusion. The world and UK's farming role within it is increasingly tuna, we call it, turbulent, uncertain, novel, ambiguous. The world is turbulent because you can't predict what's going to happen next week, let alone next year. It's uncertain because there are so many different futures open ahead of us. It's novel because we'll have new things thrown at us all the time. And it's ambiguous. There's rarely a right thing to do. There are always winners and losers and risks, uh, opportunities and threats in every decision. So we have to adapt to a tuna world. Change will increasingly happen, and it's not just change in farming, it's also change in the markets to which farming uh, contributes, it's change in the attitudes of people who buy things from the markets to which farming contributes, changes in climate and so on. So change will be an important part of the future, and so building resilience and adaptability is a key strategy for being able to adjust to the future. And of course, agricultural technology is key, but it needs more than just a focus on specialization at the farm and productivity growth. We need to have a focus on getting the food system right and the technologies for allowing farming its place within that. Thank you very much, everybody. Professor Tim Benton. Now, I'm sure that will have inspired some questions. All you have to do to ask them is to use the question area at the bottom of the screen. Our next speaker is perhaps the busiest person in the industry at the moment. It seems she's rarely off our screens and radios. She lobbies, she campaigns with some success. It's the president of the National Farmers Union, Minette Batters. 
Hello, everyone. A great opportunity to be with you today. My name's Manette Batters, and I farm in Wiltshire, and I am president of the National Farmers Union of England and Wales. Well, if we start off by just taking a, a look at effectively trade and, and transition, um, you know, we're still waiting for clarity as to what our future relationship with the EU is going to look like, whether there is going to be a deal, whether there isn't going to be a deal. Um, if it's a thin deal, what will that progress to and how much friction will that cause? And of course, all of these are, are going to have seismic impact on, on our farming businesses. Um, and all of that will ultimately impact on what transition looks like and, and trade with the rest of the world. So, you know, we've seen landmark legislation come through um, the biggest change in, in legislation since the Agricultural Act of 1947. And now within the Agricultural Bill, after long term lobbying by the NFU, having built a, a coalition that went across all farming organisations, across all environmental NGOs, all consumer groups, brought in the country's greatest chefs led by Jamie Oliver and celebrities too with Joe Wicks. Um, playing a, a sort of key role in making the point that, you know, we do not expect to see our farmers undermined in trade deals. And of course, this was a cast iron commitment by the government in their 2019 manifesto um, that they would not undermine our farmers. So for a long time now, we've been working across all these different sectors to make the case and that all culminated in a million people signing our food standards petition uh, in June of this year, really saying we don't expect to see farmers undermined. That then led through to the events that we've seen in this autumn, whereby we've seen the role of the Trade Agriculture Commission put on the face of the trade bill and the reporting process for environmental uh, aspects, sustainability aspects, animal health and welfare aspects, all being covered off um, by the group of technical experts that we hope will sit on the Commission. And that amendment in the Agricultural Bill will allow a report on all aspects of agri-food from the TAC, the Trade and Agricultural Commission, to go to Parliament at least 21 days before ratification. Now, if you imagine a world previous whereby you know, that was just simply not going to happen. It was all going to be behind the walls of, of DIT. So this allows parliamentarians to be able to have a say on behalf of their constituency farmers on each and every trade deal. So it's incredibly important, especially as we are one country, four nations. It will allow the devolved also to be able to influence and to have oversight and scrutiny of what trade is going to look like. And everything else that I say today will be shaped by uh, what, what is effectively agreed on, on trade. And ultimately, it all begins um, with the situation with the EU. Um, when we look to a future policy and what that can look like, obviously, you know, trade is going to drive it. But we are working with a whole new approach now to um, public investment in what food and farming is, is going to look like in future. And the Environmental Land Management Scheme, commonly known under the acronym of ELMS, is a tiered approach. So it's looking at three tiers that ultimately will deliver public monies for public goods. Now, we feel very strongly that this should be about uh, a sustainable food and farming scheme. We feel it's a real opportunity to incentivize uh, farmers on better resource management, on making sure that they have a safe platform on which to base their businesses. And also that this will be a points-based approach. So if you choose to do nothing, effectively you will get nothing, but the escalator will be there. So the more you do, the greater levels of public investment. And of course, when I look to our ambition um, to be delivering on climate change, um, and the opportunities of producing carbon neutral food, which is a place that we've got to get to. We've got to have a policy that helps incentivize this. So this is why uh, we brought to life a sustainable food and farming scheme um, so that we could get all farming organizations on one page co-designing what this would look like 
to make the case to government. Um, and I, I'm delighted with how it's landed. And we're in the process at the moment of getting retail and the supply chain processes, manufacturers to support it. Because the other point I'd make is without the raw ingredients here, there are none of those businesses here. We've got to make sure that the whole value chain keeps running from, from farm to fork. It's hard to put into words, really, um, what COVID has meant to all parts of the economy. Um, it's been extraordinary, I think, for food and farming. It's definitely been a story of two halves. So those selling into retail saw sales massively increase some, in some areas. We saw enormous issues early on with um, carcass balance, particularly in the beef sector. We saw huge consumer demand for mints and, of course, you know, the opportunities for out-of-home eating in our bars, hotels, pubs and restaurants were lost. So we saw a lot of, of steaks and joints just sitting in the chillers and all that did was lower price. But massive effort by retail driving promotions, you know, things did change. But it didn't stop there. You know, we saw um, an estimated 300,000 tonnes of excess potatoes um, you know, that that market loss from the out of home, you know, fish and chip shops was huge at a cost of 95,000. Um, and, you know, one of the worst price drops we saw was um, about effectively 100 pounds per ton. So it, it really was an enormous challenge. Um, with hops and cider, we saw producers were faced with a 30 percent surplus of hops and some told to only supply 80% of cider apples to brewers. Again, no warning that this was coming. Um, liquid milk, there were big, big challenges for liquid milk, namely because, um, again, you know, retail is a liquid milk market, but all the specialist cheese producers and everybody else lost their route to market, which is obviously restaurants, top end hotels, and exports. And the, the picture was mirrored, you know, right across the world. So it didn't just happen here. It happened everywhere. Um, dairy, goat dairying, again, enormous impacts um, for the goat and, and sheep milk industry. Um, and it, it, it went on into the growing sector. You know, we saw routes to market lost also for ornamentals. So for all of us as farmers and growers, we saw those routes to market distorted just because these are perishable products. You know, other businesses were able to lock their doors furlough their workers and, and just sit tight. Obviously for agriculture and horticulture, that was never an option. So we, we just had to make sure that we kept going. But there will be, there will be enormous lessons um, to learn from all of this. And we must make sure that that legacy of COVID lives on. So when we look at barriers to data and innovation in agriculture, I think we have to start with the fact that, you know, farmers think that data effectively equals compliance. And farmers have always, in my experience, been, been wary uh, of, of sharing their data. And in fact, in the world that we are living in, certainly the world that we are going in, data is absolutely key. Evidence is absolutely key. And data ownership is about how we add value. If we haven't got the evidence base, it's very hard to add value. And of course, you've got enormous dynamics of distance between field and research decisions. You know, we've always seen a challenge with getting that applied science actionable and on the ground. And, you know, when we look to delivering our ambition for net zero to delivering on the ambition for carbon neutral food, that is all about incentivizing um, better farming practice, climate smart farming, focusing on, on ever more efficiency measures so that we are continuing to decrease our food production footprint, produce more from less. And the whole role of data, technology, innovation, R&D is, is a game changer in this area. But data is only ever as good as, as how you can use it. So it's essential for farmers that they own the data. I, I think AHDB, the Agricultural and Horticultural Development Board, has an enormous role in, in owning uh, the data sets and making sure that we can effectively sift from that point what is going to continue down the supply chain. 
But there is no doubt that the consumer, the customer base is expecting more. They've got a thirst for knowledge. They want to know about the integrity of the food supply chain. Um, and there's massive interest in provenance and food integrity. So it's in our interest as farmers to make sure that that data can travel down the chain. And to give another example would be um, responsible use of antibiotics and medicine, the role of rumour, which has made sure that actually, you know, we really do have a, a great PR platform for the work that, that we're doing as farmers in lowering our antibiotic usage. Of course, that's not only good for our livestock, better animal health, but that's good for human health too. And data and, and how data travels is key for delivering on, on carbon neutrality without any shadow of doubt. It's the only way that we're going to be able to show the world what we've done and what will ultimately underpin the future brand. I just want to touch on my final slide between data, how it can empower farmers to avoid risks being dumped on their business. Um, we've got to look at, at, at a better, fairer functioning supply chain. We've got to look more at how we roll out the GSCOP and how uh, that supply chain is actually monitored, how it becomes more transparent. We've got to look at how we balance risk across the supply chain so that the farmer is not carrying the majority of the risk. And, this is really, really important now because, of course, it is going back to a time where there will not be the levels of direct support, which we have been farming with for quite a long time now. And this has ultimately underpinned a lot of farming businesses. And if you look at the figures, of course, over 60 percent of businesses are only profitable at this moment with direct support. Going to the new world of public monies for public goods is, is a game changer and it will mean that farmers' businesses ultimately have to stand on their own two feet. So that functionality of the supply chain and what we believe should be an enforcement officer that ultimately makes sure that chain is functioning fairly is, is going to be really, really key. Um, we've got to look at resilience, about how we build better resilience uh, into the industry We've got to face the fact that trade is going to open up the sector to many more imports. You know, we're going to see much, much more volatility going forwards. And there's so much focus uh, often on the world of retail and making sure that the labelling is working as it should be. And retail ultimately is, is very transparent and very, you know, country of origin labelling, very clear. What you see is what you get, but that is not the same. Um, for the other part of the market, the out-of-home market, which is, of course, 50% of the market. So how do we keep that, that honest and um, people knowing that actually what they think is buying British really is buying British? How do we make sure that the raw ingredients that are going into manufacturing and processing, that ultimately, if it says British, that it is British, rather than just bringing in ingredients that are not produced to the same standards here and adding value to them under the Union Jack? That again, there is a massive role to play going forwards of Red Tractor assurance and accreditation to make sure that the customer always knows that the product is an honest product and is precisely what it says on the tin. If I look towards, um, you know, how do we empower farmers um, to avoid these, these risks of, of being dumped on without doubt, climate uh, and environmental sustainability are really, really important. So I look at our long term investment in soy and soya, um, making sure that we are always sourcing sustainable soy and soya. We've got to continue doing that because the danger is that, you know, if we keep high levels of rules and regulations here and we don't commit to the same aspirations across the world, all we do is undermine our own marketplace here and ultimately put our farmers and growers at, at an enormous competitive disadvantage. So carbon is the opportunity of our time. I, I do think as far as uh, carbon neutral food goes and sustainable living, which we tend to often forget about, you know, the opportunity to produce a lot more of our, our fibres, wool, 
all of those things that can be can be grown. We've got to be growing things on the surface of the world rather than mining out of the core of it, because that way we can continue to replenish what we're doing. And we're working with the biodegradable products as well. And there's been enormous innovations uh, around packaging and plant based. You've got things like milkweed that can be grown to produce latex now. Um, a very, very exciting time um, for farmers in that, you know, there are many things that the world needs that we can provide effectively the man made substitutes for that ultimately are, are better for businesses and equally as importantly, better for the planet. And then we look to water. You know, we are sourcing a vast amount of our fruit and veg out of very water scarce parts of the world when we have a plentiful supply of water here. So we've got to be looking at how we make better use of our water, how we move it across the country, how we avoid diffuse water going just out into the sea to be wasted. Um, in many cases, we have a story that is showing too much water in some places and not enough in others. And then awful problems with abstraction licensing on the back of some of the areas in this country whereby we, we produce a vast amount of our fruit and vegetables. You know, East Anglia in particular faces a, a lot of challenges with not having enough water at certain times of the year. If you compare that to the sort of northwest and Scotland where they've got a plentiful supply of water, we should be able to move it. And this in turn will allow us to drive this horticultural revolution that we've talked about and be producing much more of our fruit and veg here. But we've got to be able to innovate and, and look at water in a very different manner. And then of course, you know, we've got to look at biodiversity. And if we get the farming practice right, and what I said about the sustainable food and farming scheme, if we can get into, into those businesses, into the field, start focusing on our soils and how we are farming instead of farming entitlements, then biodiversity outcomes are a natural given of, of a better farming practice. So, you know, I hope that's just sort of given a, a whirlwind trip through. Um, it is a time of enormous and, and really quite radical change. There are, without doubt, big risks uh, ahead. Um, and we have to get this right because 70 percent of the UK is a farmed landscape. So it's really important for the future health and well-being of this country that we, we bring effectively um, the countryside to life, not just in our role as farmers, as food producers, but also in our role as custodians of the landscape and our ability um, to store carbon as well and the enormous opportunities that there are out there, not only with producing food, but actually the ability to offset um, for other sectors and for the public and private sector to really share the ambition uh, of how we bring our countryside to life as what is probably, you know, the opportunity of our time right now. Thanks ever so much. Minette Batters from the National Farmers Union. Again, if you have questions, just use the question area at the bottom of the screen and we'll answer them all in the session at 10 past four. Our next speaker is Ellen Wilson. She is Microsoft UK's lead for sustainability and smart cities. Ellen is passionate about technology and the role it can play in developing a smarter and more sustainable future for communities. Ellen Wilson. Good morning. To begin this presentation, I would like to take you a few months ago back. Do you remember in lockdown when we went for our walks and everything seemed so much brighter? The roads were quiet, the air was fresh, and we saw more butterflies and wildlife than ever before. And there even was dolphins in the Venice Canal. The harsh reality is, while analysts disagree about how much emissions have gone down by this year, the International Energy Agency puts the reduction at around 8%. In real terms, that means the equivalent of 47 billion tons that we'll be releasing instead of 51 billion. And in the words of our very own Bill Gates, that's a meaningful reduction. However, consider what it's taken to achieve this 8%. It's not a situation that anyone would want to continue. What's remarkable is not by how much emissions have gone down by, but how little. And that's exactly why sustainability is such an important topic and one that we must resurface now. 
So for the next 20 minutes, I'll be discussing the role that technology can play, and I'll be sharing you Microsoft's own journey and some of the learnings that I hope are relevant for your industry too. We don't need to define sustainability. It's already been done by the United Nations. In 2015, all 190 United Nations member states adopted the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And as you can see, it can be broadly split into societal developmental goals and environmentally development goals. And in total, there is 17. Technology has the opportunity to play a leading role in helping us achieve the sustainable development goals. Let me give you a few facts. Today, Facebook users collectively have a larger population than China or India. Apple is worth more than the entire US energy sector. And in 2019, two thirds of customers globally interacted with a chatbot rather than a human. More broadly across the economy, an estimated 70% of new value will be created based on digitally enabled platforms. The quotes in the data is taken from a joint PwC and World Economic Forum report that was released in 2019, looking at the fourth industrial revolution and some of the technologies that are driving it. From AI, that's artificial intelligence, to IoT, Internet of Things, to drone and 5G, they're already impacting the sustainable development goals, as you can see on the right. As for the UK, in June 2019, we became the first major economy to commit to a legally binding net zero emissions target by 2050. While some of this will be achieved through offsetting, the majority will require bold transformation and technological innovation. Let's have a look at those two graphs and let's take agriculture, for example. Those two graphs de depict the impact that technology can have on the sector, both from a monetary value, but also from a carbon impact. So on the left, you can see that it's relatively little. It's about 0 0.1 billion pounds that you can improve by using technology in agriculture. However, if you look at the carbon impact, that is quite considerable. Through technologies like satellite tracking, radio tax on livestock, airborne thermal imaging and ground level sensors, precision farming brings IoT sensors and AI systems together to monitor farm data in real time. But it's not just traditional industries that have to change. It's also the tech industry itself, which is why now I'm going to share Microsoft's journey with you. And Microsoft actually hasn't been a stranger to sustainability. In effect, our journey started about 10 years ago. We introduced a carbon tax in 2012, which allowed us to be carbon neutral from then. We also invested in an energy smart building system that allowed us to really drive down our energy consumption and both enable us to um, be um, more mindful about the energy we use and drive down cost. In 2017, we launched a program called AI for Earth, which I know Agrimetrics was part of as well. And we've worked on some fantastic programs there. The, ambition for AI or for Earth was to put data and resources at the hands of developers, scientists and, um, and startups to really tackle some of the world's most challenging problems. And I'd just love to give you a couple of examples around um, some of the um, partners that we've worked with. So the first one is WildMe and that is a brilliant um, tool that everyone can engage with. So for example, when we can travel again and you go on a safari, um, you download the app WildMe and you take pictures of the animals. It automatically uploads it into the cloud and the artificial intelligence analyzes each picture. Now, each fur pattern is unique and this data will be shared with conservationists and it helps them analyze um, herd health and herd movement. So whenever you go back on a safari, I really recommend you do it. The second one I wanted to touch on is Sylvia Terra, which is a partner um, in the States. And what these guys do is they use um, satellite imaging to monitor forests and monitor regrowth of forest and the AI decides where the best place to plant tree for the maximum carbon offsetting impact is. Again, absolutely brilliant partner. However, in 2020, at the beginning of this year, um, Microsoft felt that those companies and organizations that can do more really should do more. And we revamped our sustainability strategy. And we now have four big buckets that we look in. Carbon, water, waste and ecosystem. And the way we go about it is we really build it into our circular um, economy approach. So we think about the way we design our operations, the way we run our data centers, for example, we have to make sure that they are as environmentally friendly as possible. We think about the way we design our products and services. So if you take our surface products, for example, um, 
remember back there was a time when all IT equipment used to get smaller and smaller and smaller and in effect once your screen broke you had to throw it away. With Surface Now we build repairability back into the product which basically means the idea is that you can keep the product for longer, you can repair it and you minimize the impact you can have both on waste and on carbon. The really exciting thing is as well how we um, engage with our customers and partners. We have a number of partner solutions that can help customers to really increase um, their um, sustainability efforts and it's really really great fun working with them and also we um, use our voice and actually influence policy where we feel it's required and being a Microsoft employee what is really nice is the employee bit at the heart of it all we have so many um, sustainability communities across the entire globe we have one in the UK and we run hackathons and we run projects because people feel passionate about the subject and they feel they can have a real impact. Now let me take you through what we announced. Back in January we made the first announcement which was around carbon and we stated that we were going to be carbon negative by 2030. We're going to remove all the carbon that we've ever emitted since the company's inception in 1975 by 2050. Now that is quite a big and bold target and there's an appreciation that actually we can't do that without innovation, which is why Microsoft has put aside a $1 billion climate innovation fund where we'll be investing into projects and technologies that we feel is going to help us get there. The second announcement was around creating a planetary computer. And this really is based on the learnings that we took from our AI for Earth program. Whilst every project there was wonderful and had a real impact, it was felt that wouldn't it be great if we could combine the data from those projects and really start modeling the impact that we can have um, globally or locally. So say you run a project locally, what's the impact globally going to be? So the idea of the planetary computer was born. In August 2020, we announced our zero waste commitment. We will be zero waste by 2030. There's two areas that I would like to highlight here. Um, the first one is the establishment of circular centers. Now, if you think about the amount of um, cloud computing that Microsoft provides and the amount of data centers we have across the globe, actually being able to reuse the servers and hardware for longer is going to have a real impact. So we have established these circular centers at every data center location, where we're really trying and aiming at extending the life cycle of each server. Normally, we would run them for four to five years and they would be um, recycled. Now we're trying to really extend that and get the repurpose rate up to 90%. And then a personal bugbearer of mine is the single use plastics in packaging. I still don't quite understand why we need it. So really happy that we have decided to eliminate those as well. We also made an announcement around water and we're going to be water positive by 2030. And again, we're going to build on some of the learnings that we had from our AI for Earth program. Now, the reason I'm sharing all of this with you is that we actually had some really relevant learnings that I feel might be beneficial to everyone who's listening to this. So number one is um, around cloud computing. We've done studies that have proven that if you run your workloads in a cloud, rather than on your own premise, can actually reduce the energy impact by up to 93% and the carbon impact by up to 98%. So whenever you're taking on new work or you're looking at um, maybe moving out of your data center, really consider where you move your workloads to. From a behavioral perspective, we also felt that um, carbon tax actually really drove the right behavior both internally and also from the beginning of this year, we've actually extended the carbon tax out to our third parties and suppliers as well, because we really want them to drive the right behavior with their supply chain as well. Smart buildings is a really interesting one as well, because um, it consists of about 40% of the energy consumption um, across EMEA is because of buildings. So by deploying smart buildings solutions um, on your premises, so that is sensors or video cameras that really help you manage the temperature in the building, the occupancy in the building, and also nowadays very important, the airflow of the building, you can really reduce your energy consumption by up to 20%. And then finally, we've all experienced it. We're all working from home. Um, working from home and remote working really reduces and accelerates carbon reductions. So what I would say here is as and when we reopen offices, let's really reconsider and consider what kind of world we want to live in. Do we want to be back on the seven o'clock train sitting in the office from nine to five? Or is there a cleverer way to get started? Now, 
what does this mean to you? Where can you start if you're interested? Um, we can't manage what we can't measure. It's an old saying and it applies here as well. So we, you really should start by understanding your environmental impact. Think about um, the carbon emissions that you're producing today. Then investing in innovation. The Deloitte report that I shared with you earlier really proved that point that innovation is going to be really, really, and digital innovation is going to really help you accelerate. And then obviously you can work with partners that have super innovative solutions in this place. If you're still not 100% convinced um, that sustainability is for you, I would like to leave you with a few thoughts on here. And sustainability really is better for business. Whether it's the millennial joining the workforce um, and really deciding where they want to work, and millenn millennials do care about sustainability, or I even heard um, studies that they actually pick up the phone if they're not happy with your brand because of your sustainable or lack of sustainability efforts. And also there's going to be a huge um, value creation within sustainability. So with that, I would like to thank you and hope you had something to take from this presentation. And please feel free to get in touch if you would like to hear more. Thank you. Ellen Wilson from Microsoft UK. Thank you to all our three speakers. If you have questions for one or all of them, please do pose them by using the question area at the bottom of the screen and we'll get to them in the Q&A at about 10 past four this afternoon. Now we're going to take a break of about 25 minutes, but please do rejoin us. We'll be discussing climate and net zero, sustainable productivity, crop and livestock health and food provenance and quality with people from all four of the UK Agritech centres. See you in 25 minutes. <laughs>